a lot of uh, disturbing stuff in there, and we're going to talk about some of that disturbing stuff momentarily here with Brad Jacobs. And actually, let's uh, let's get right to it. Brad is uh, on the line. As everyone knows, we only have people named Brad here on the Bradcast. So Brad Jacobson is a Brooklyn-based freelance journalist and a contributing reporter for Alternet. He's, his reporting has also appeared in The Atlantic, Columbia Journalism Review, Billboard, and other publications. Other publications, by the way, such as bradblog.com, as I recall. I believe uh, Brad has uh, guest blogged over uh, for us a few times over the years. His new story, The Worst Yet to Come, Why Nuclear Experts Are Calling Fukushima a Ticking Time Bomb, starts this way. More than a year after the triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, the Japanese government, Tokyo, Electronic, uh, to- Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, present similar assurances of the site's current state. Challenges remain, they say, but everything is under control. The worst is over. But nuclear waste experts say the Japanese are literally playing with fire in the way nuclear spent fuel continues to be stored on site, especially in Reactor 4, which contains the most irradiated fuel, ten times the deadly cesium-137 released during the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident. These experts also charge that the NRC is letting this threat fester because acknowledging it would call into question safety at dozens of identically designed nuclear plant power plants around the U.S., which contain exceedingly higher volumes of spent fuel in similar elevated pools outside of reinforced containment. That's the beginning of this startling report from Brad Jacobson over at Alternate. Brad joins us now. Hey, Brad, welcome to the broadcast, sir. Hey, sir. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. G- g- glad you could be here. This is uh, kind of a terrifying report. Nice job, Brad. I'm not easily scared, but you've done the done the job. Uh, these experts you talk to about what is going on with this. Uh, uh, spent fuel pool at nu- at uh, Reactor 4, these aren't sort of fringe anti-nuke activists, uh, you know, who are express- expressing concern here, right? These are some uh, pretty serious nuclear engineers and experts, are they not? Uh, absolutely. I mean, what the, the premier person, the go- one of the go-to people in the article is Robert Alvarez, mm-hmm. who was the senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy for some years in the Clinton administration. Uh, and he's this is one particular area of his specialty uh, he specializes in. Uh, so he he worked on this while he was in the Clinton administration and uh, has been following this afterwards. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he's been concerned about this for many years. And right now the situation over at Fukushima is um, is something that, relatively speaking, could happen at 31 reactors here in the U.S., which have the same... Mark One or Mark Two designs mm-hmm. that are used at uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And uh, Senator Ron Wyden was similarly alarmed about what he saw uh, when he uh, recently toured uh, the Fukush- Fukushima Daiichi uh, power plant. Uh, he's a member of the a senior member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. He believes the situation there is, quote, worse than reported with, quote, spent fuel rods currently being stored in unsound structures immediately adjacent to the ocean. He's talking about those spent fuel pools in reactor number four. Brad Jacobson explained to us the precarious uh, position that this uh, pool of uh, fuel rods is now in at Fukushima. This is remarkable. Sure. Well, the other thing he observed, first of all, was that it's it's uh, the only protection that he observed in a press release that said from a future tsunami is a makeshift seawall erected out of bags of rock. That's the quote from his press release. Yep. Uh, but the the actual, the whole situation there is so precarious. First of all, it's ironic that reactor number four, uh, as opposed to one through three where the meltdowns occurred, reactor mm-hmm. number four is not in operation. The nuclear core was not in operation when the tsunami hit but it had just uploaded, spent, or, or radiated fuel, very highly radioactive fuel. And in these designs, in all of them, uh, the fuel is, is located in these spent fuel pools, which are elevated about 100 feet off the ground, and they're outside, in this fantastic design, they're <laughs> located outside of the main reinforced containment that contains 
the the core. So what happened was during the tsunami, the uh, in the early days after the tsunami hit, there was a hydrogen explosion that blew the roof off. So mm -hmm. not only is this uh, structure not that sound that's surrounding uh, the spent fuel, but the structure, the, the top part was completely blown off, and it sent the building into a list. So it is completely exposed to the elements. And as you mentioned at the beginning um, from the article, uh, just that reactor four contains uh, the, 10 times the amount of cesium, which is a highly uh, radioactive, uh, pervasive, volatile uh, kind of isotope that was released during Chernobyl in 1986. And so let me just uh, sort of repeat that to, to make sure that people understand that. We were talking about uh, uh, reactors one through three. They were actually operational uh, on March 11, 2011, when the earthquake and the, uh, and the tsunami hit. Uh, and, and they got most of the attention because they were up and running and, and trying to power them down. Uh, when they had no power, uh, no water, uh, that's where a lot of the attention went. But uh, there was also reactors 4, 5, and 6. 5 and 6 had been shut down for a while for maintenance, as had 4, but 4 had recently been shut down and had some uh, pretty fresh uh, 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 nuclear uranium tubes in this pool of water. The pool of water... Brad Jacobs, and you say it's not in the protected unit that they would that the rods would otherwise be in if they were in the reactor. They're sort of sitting outside the hardened unit, uh, sort of up there, a hundred feet up in the air, in a tub. Literally, this is, we're talking about a bathtub full of water with these nuclear rods in them. Correct? Uh, basically correct. Yeah, it's, it's, it's roughly you know it's a big bathtub. It's, right. Uh, it's supposed to be roughly forty <clears throat> feet deep. Um, but it has no lid on it. It has no concrete or steel casing. Uh, it's, it's sort of an open tub of water with the rods stored in it, 100 feet up, in a building that now has no roof at all. Uh, didn't have much of a roof to begin with. It's built sort of like a Walmart, but, uh, as you describe it in your article, Brad. But the roof's blown off. Now the building is sort of leaning to the side, and you've got this pool of radioactive rods uh, sort of suspended 100 feet up in the air. That is the dire situation. And, you know, some other aspects of this are that, uh, you know, they, the NRC says that TEPCO and the Japanese government say that the building was, you know, sent that was sent into a list, mm -hmm. this reactor 4, that it's been restabilized. But, you know, it's been restabilized in the sense that I think they've, they uh, put some structure up to, to prevent the list from completely collapsing, but as the experts that I spoke with pointed out, the whole structure is still unsound. It is not as sound as it was originally meant to be built uh, for, and regardless, it's, even, if it were, even if it were sound, as, as Robert Alvarez points out, it still doesn't take away the fact that it's in this precarious nature anyway. It's, it's sitting there totally exposed to the elements. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, which is, this mirrors the same problem with these type of designs here in the U.S., mm -hmm. which is there's no instrumentation in these G Mark I and Mark II boiling water reactors to tell you there's no built-in in instrumentation on the spent fuel pools to tell you what the pressure, what the to gauge the radiation, the temperature, uh -huh. or the pressure levels. So that's why there was a helicopter flying over in early days to see to see if there's any water in reactor four. And the thing is, similarly at Chernobyl, the people, the poor guys who were up there in a the helicopter looking at this, I mean, they experienced the doses of radiation that, uh, you know, experts said also will probably cause them to have an early life. And, and it's because these uh, fuel pools, when they, were, when, when they were originally designed, they weren't meant to be permanent storage for these rods, right? They were for uh, taking rods out of the reactor and then transferring them to some permanent storage unit for spent uh, fuel rods that apparently does not exist, whether it's in, uh, it certainly doesn't exist here in the U.S., where these similar models of nuclear plants have been storing these rods now for decades with nowhere to store them, and they're filling up their spent pu fuel pools that are supposed to be temporary with even more rods than are currently uh, endangering the Fukushima plant, correct? There is a, correct, there is a massive amount of spent fuel which dwarfs anywhere in the world here in the U.S. Uh, in, in, in these spent fuel pools. 
uh, early on there was going to be reprocessing, but mm-hmm. once once that fell through, it didn't take a foothold in this country. Uh, in the early 1980s, the NRC decided that the nuclear industry was then allowed to use these high-density pools. And in all these pools were never built for to hold more than a quarter or a fifth of what they hold, but yet they allowed that, and then eventually they were going to maybe bring it, uh, deposit it into, uh, was it Yucca Mountain? Right. Um, once that fell through, <laughs> um, there is nowhere to put it, and more recently the NRC just arbitrarily decided now it's safe to store this, you know, as, as uh, one of the experts mentioned, uh, you know, to cram these pools to the gills with this highly radiated spent fuel uh, for the next 120 years. <laughs> they, they just decided that, that that'll be fine, 120 years. And, and this is the same NRC and the same, by the way, Barack Obama administration, which has just approved two new, two new nuclear plants uh, in this country, correct? Correct. Uh, back to uh, Fukushima now and these, uh, this precarious pool of spent nuclear rods uh, 100 feet in the air. Uh, the concern now that these experts have is that if another uh, earthquake and or tsunami hits, there is absolutely nothing to protect this, uh, this pool of rods at this point. What, is, what, is the cons- what are the possibilities of such an earthquake? And if it does happen, if something does happen to this uh, pool of uh, spent fuel, what happens then, Brad Jacobson? Well, this is the scariest scenario of them all, um, which, which, you know, it, even if just the spent fuel in, the, in the Reactor 4, if Reactor 4 goes, uh, that's a, a situation that is, is horrific in its own sake. But if, uh, if Reactor 4 goes, the, the, the nightmare scenario is that it, it ignites uh, the spent fuel in, and this is just the spent fuel, by the way. I mm-hmm. didn't point this out in my article. I didn't have you know room to point out so many things right. in my article as long as it was. Um, you know, this is just we're talking about the spent fuel, not uh-huh. the not the uh, radioactivity in the in the core, but just the spent fuel on the site at Fukushima. If if reactor four ignites, they're afraid that the rest of spent fuel and the other reactors would ignite, and the amount of spent fuel uh, that that the amount of cesium-137 that I mentioned before, mm-hmm. uh, deadly cesium-137, is, is 85 times the amount that was released at Chernobyl. And that is the, the nightmare scenario, which the New York Times reported back in February, mm-hmm. that the Japanese government was contemplating when they were contemplating uh, evacuating Tokyo. And that could happen in the event of another earthquake, and experts are looking at uh, earthquakes which have uh, since been occurring uh, around uh, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi plant, and they expect they may be hit again soon with another large uh, quake out there. This is a remarkable story. Uh, Brad Jacobson, I'd like to talk to you more about this in the future. I hope we can do that. In the meantime, check out Brad Jacobson's report at alternate.org. The worst yet to come, why nuclear experts are calling Fukushima a ticking time bomb. Thanks for scaring the hell out of me, Brad. (laughs) Sorry, but thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, Thanks a bunch. Uh, Really appreciate it. And, of course, uh, today the uh, Japanese government announced they will nationalize the Fukushima Daiichi plant. They will take it over to avert collapse of the Tokyo Electronic Power Company. What a mess, and yet we press on with nukes in this country.